Since September the 11th and the war against terror, Britain's mosques are headline news. From Croydon to Finsbury Park, Leicester to Tipton, those who control mosques have become the center of public interest. Tonight, growing numbers of British Muslims reveal why they're no longer prepared to tolerate imams and mosque committees who betray their trust. Finsbury Park Mosque in North London has become notorious for its links to terrorism. The mosque has been connected to kidnappers in the Yemen, the Brixton Shoe Bomber and British Taliban fighters currently held in Cuba. At the center of the controversy is Abu Hamza, vocal supporter of Osama bin Laden. When another plane goes down now, is it a local beat? Or an SOS net. But it's the way he was able to take over the mosque and impose his own hardline views that has given most cause for concern amongst other Muslims. The idea is to slow down and make the sky very high risk for anybody who flies. This sort of approach is very enormously damaging to the petition of Islam and Muslim community in UK. I mean, they are using Islam as a tool. They have hijacked the uh, holy verses for their own political agenda. Really. Abu Hamza's political activities also reveal a flawed system where one man can forcibly take control of a mosque at the expense of the regular worshippers. Mufti Barkatullah is a trustee of the mosque. Officially, he's supposed to oversee what goes on there, but he's actually too scared to go inside. I'm completely powerless because I fear when I go that someone will intimidate me or someone will challenge me and put me in an awkward position and without any provocation they will abuse me verbally and sometimes physically if they can. When Finsbury Park Mosque opened in 1985, it was the pride of the community supported by Prince Charles and nearly a million pounds from the Saudi royal family. But within five years, the mosque was in trouble. Civil war had broken out on the committee. So strange as it now seems, the charismatic Abu Hamza was invited to sort things out. He came as a go-between, but uh, he gradually elevated himself to the Lord and King of the mosque. Hamza came to the mosque as an employee of the trustees, but soon imposed his own authority. The trustees, they could no longer communicate, meet, or do any decision. So as soon as the, the board collapsed, Abu Hamza took every single control in the mosque. It wasn't long before Hamza was using his influence to promote a holy war on the West. Alarmed, the trustees, as guarantors of the mosque's integrity, tried to challenge the way Hamza was running things with a court injunction. It only made things worse. At that point, Abu Hamza became the extremely violent. As a result of injunction, uh, I tried to take the regular imam to install him in Friday. We were all bundled out of the mosque by force. The trustees can't afford to go back to court, so they're stuck with the status quo. It's unclear who's legally in charge here, but in reality, Abu Hamza controls the mosque. I mean, since that time, he has been, uh, you know, behaving differently. He's sometimes threatening the trust, holding them as a hostage, sometimes being very conciliatory. With no outside religious body able to impose order, the mosque has fallen into disrepair, a far cry from its lavish beginnings. 
the building is running down as a derelict and the level of services and the facilities are going down and it's smelly and filthy mosque really. The pulpit has such a magic and the imam from the pulpit can influence the community in many respects uh, which need to be supervised, needs to be controlled. Dr. Badawi heads Britain's leading Muslim legal authority. He says control isn't as straightforward as in the church. We don't have a clergy. We don't have a sort of a structure like a church. You know, all mosques are equal. All imams are independent. So without a governing body running British mosques, disputes can simply go on and on, as Muslims in Luton have found to their cost. Today's prayer meeting followed the troubles last night when supporters of the imam tried to break into the building. Extra police had been drafted to the troubled mosque after a judge ordered them... In 1992, the Muslim community of Luton hit the media spotlight when there was a standoff between the imam and the mosque committee. We were laughed at by, by other members of uh, the community, and rightly so. We had built this massive uh, place. We had uh, a big uh, center up the road, and still some of us were praying inside and some were, uh, were praying outside, making a spectacle of ourselves. Luton's first Muslim migrants arrived in the 50s and 60s, when men like Akbar Khan came from the Kashmiri region of Pakistan. Luton was an attractive place to come to work because everybody who came over uh, knew someone down here, very close to the airport, and Vauxhall provided very good uh, wage packet at the end of the week. After a stint at Vauxhall's and the post office, Khan turned to taxi driving. Like many others, his plan wasn't always to stay. We will work for a while, earn some money, come back, set up a business, build a house and uh, get on uh, uh, with life back in Azad Kashmir. Those early migrants kept in touch with the old country and each other through their religion. They clubbed together and bought a terraced house and then another and finally a third. When families joined the men in the mid-70s, the community decided it was time for a more permanent solution. They started to raise money to build a purpose-built mosque and community centre. It's a working-class community where people would save uh, 50 pounds at the end of the, of, the, of the week. And out of those um, 50, perhaps 15 or uh, 20 would go towards the mosque project and the project up the road. The mosque appointed an imam to guide the community and help coordinate support for the mosque project. As the figurehead of a million pound project, Imam Abdul Chisti developed a loyal following and huge personal authority. People virtually gave money to him, trusting that he is the man, whatever is coming out of his mouth is, uh, is truth. Building began in 1982, and to keep some continuity, the mosque committee decided to postpone elections and stay on beyond their allotted two years. But within another year, things started to turn sour. When people would like to ask questions about running of the mosque, about the funds, and about when elections would be held, uh, they would, they would not get any, any answer out of, uh, out of that management committee or, for that matter, the, the, the imam who was very much the linchpin of the, 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 the whole thing. Akbar Khan wasn't alone in his concern about the power wielded by the imam. Mr. Chesti was himself manager, he was himself imam, he was himself trustees, and everything he was controlling himself. The Trust say Mr. Chisti has had no management role at any time and that the decision to become a Trust was taken by a properly constituted AGM.